Bienvenue, bonsoir, bienvenue à tout le monde. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to do this entire thing in French. I just wanted to have my Eurovision moment and I really want this hour that we've got together to feel almost like a moment of armchair travel. I'm speaking to you from my bedroom in, which seems very French, in London. And one of the things I'm going to be missing most about this pandemic year, uh, and let's assume it's pretty much going to be the rest of this year, although I'd love to be surprised by that, is the inability to travel, to go to places that we love, to be amongst other cultures that we love. And for me, that culture is France. And every year I would go to France at least several times a year and spend a lot of the summer uh, in France. It's been that way in my life since I was about 11 years old. So it's a time of great sadness for me that I'm not able um, to go over to France. But I hope that we can bring um, un petit peu uh, de joie de vivre somehow um, by having this time that we've got together to discuss how to be happy lessons from French literature. And this is based um, all on my new book, which has just been published in the US today and is coming out in the UK next week called Au Revoir Tristesse, Lessons in Happiness from French Literature. Uh, as Dana said, it's a mix of memoir and literary criticism, literary history, um, a lot about the author's biographies and the, the places that they were in their own lives psychologically when they wrote uh, the books that I talk about um, in Au Revoir Tristesse. And I cover 12 different uh, authors, 12 different works of literature in that book. But today I just want to try and maybe center this around half a dozen authors. And I want to look at how those authors reflect happiness in their work and what we can take away from that. But most of all, what I wanted to do today was to really sell you the idea of French classics as comfort reading. I'm sure lots of you know that at the moment the publishing industry is having a really tough time, but comfort reading and classics are proving to be something that people are seeking out at the moment. And for me, having read these authors, French authors, since I was about 12 or 13, starting off in translation and then later on trying to read them in French when I did my degree in French um, at Cambridge back in the early 1990s, I was so taken with how these authors relate to life and how our perception and our stereotype of what French literature is, which is often something that is quite full of doom and gloom, very serious, very academic, and um, Proust figures very heavily, I think, in that stereotype that we have of French literature. And for me, when I came to read these authors, I found almost the opposite, that they're just so full of life, there's, there's a lot of humour, there's a lot of passion, and what I wanted to do today was really look at what really brings these works alive and how relevant they can be to us now. I wanted to kick off with a quote that hopefully will inspire you generally speaking, but I think it's also inspiring for the present moment. And it's a quote from the poet, Paul Eluard. And he's important because it was Paul Eluard whose words, Bonjour Tristesse, inspired uh, the title of François Sagan's novel, which I think was probably the first uh, French novel that I ever read. And I would have certainly read it in English back then. Although if you do speak French, it's a great place to go back and check how good your French is because it's a very uh, short novel, only 100 pages, um, great place to check where your French is up to by reading that novel. So Eluard um, has a poem called A peine défiguré, which features the words adieu tristesse, bonjour tristesse. And when François Sagan was 17, she read this poem, she thought that's an extraordinary idea, bonjour tristesse, what does this mean? Chose it as a title of her novel, based the entire character of Cecilia, this 17 year old um, who goes on holiday with her father to the south of France and has this, in the end, disastrous summer that ends in this terrible tristesse moment. But there's a fantastic Eloire quote, which I think really sums up the whole of French literature's attitude towards happiness. And it's also very relevant for this moment. And it is this. J'ai reconnu le bonheur au bruit qu'il a fait en partant. 
j'ai reconnu le bonheur au bruit qu'il a fait en partant. I recognized happiness by the noise it made in departing. I recognized happiness by the noise it made when it left. And to me, this is the fantastic conundrum of lots of French literature. Um, obviously, I'm massively generalizing, but I feel as if so many French uh, classics fall under this idea that we only recognize true happiness when it has gone. And that's why we have this um, slightly self-contradicting idea in French literature of it seems to be full of disaster, full of doom, gloom, full of gloom. And yet when you read it, it depicts many moments of happiness, many moments of joy, but it also depicts many characters who only realize what they had after it's gone. The other thing I really wanted to mention at this moment is what are people in France talking about at the moment? And I was very taken with um, a few things I've been reading um, about Bernard-Henri Lévy, the French philosopher uh, and uh, popular intellectual, I don't know how popular he is these days, but uh, he has a new book out this week, which is called Ce Virus Qui Nous Rend Fou, this virus which is driving us crazy. And I love the idea that he's already, like in the space of 10 weeks, managed to turn around an entire philosophical book about the virus. But he has a very interesting take uh, on happiness that lots of people in France are talking about this week in the coverage surrounding his book. I'm sure lots of you will be familiar with the idea that was popularized by Jean-Paul Sartre, l'enfer c'est les autres, hell is other people. You also have the idea that um, Bernard-Henri Henri Lévy talks about from Pascal as well, like l'enfer c'est moi. So hell can be the others, hell can also be you, you, you yourself. L'enfer c'est moi, hell is me. So we can make our lives hell ourselves, or we can recognize, as Sartre says, l'enfer c'est les autres, hell is other people. So the opposite of happiness is other people because they're so annoying, and also yourself because you're so annoying. Now this week, what a lot of people have been talking about um, that Bernard-Henri um, Bernard um, Lévy has started off this conversation, he has devised this new coronavirus idea that he's calling l'enfer c'est le corps. Hell is the body. And I love that he's come up with this uh, very simple but clever idea where he's saying hell is not other people. Uh, our happiness in this present moment really is dependent on other people, how we get on with them, the connections that we make, however flawed through these te technologies like Zoom, however close, even though socially distanced through our neighbors that we might be getting to know that we didn't perhaps know beforehand. Um, hell is not other people and hell is not the self because the self is something that's very important for us to cling on to at the moment. But hell is the body and the body is our enemy. Um, during this crisis. I love the idea and I love that uh, this is a discussion that is really fresh on a philosophical level in France um, thanks to this book um, that I really recommend you check out. So, ce virus qui, ce virus qui nous rend fou, Bernard-Henri Lévy. But to the authors I want to talk about today, and before I start, I'd love for you to share uh, in the question and answer function um, at any time, just jot down books that you've loved, books that you've hated, authors who have really put you off, authors you'd love to discover and know more about, but you haven't had the time. Um, I'd love to get an idea of what your connection is with French literature, what, uh, any, any questions you want to ask, no question is too um, boring, no question is too simple, ask me anything you want, let's open up this conversation um, and feel free to ask in French if you feel like uh, it, why not? The three things that I wanted to draw out of this topic about how French authors tackle happiness are, um, well, they involve me splitting the authors into three different groups. And I thought about, can I make them in, into this grouping? Dupin, Duvin, Duboursin. I'm sure that people will remember this advert, uh, Boursin fans. I couldn't find any Boursin. The nearest I could find was my husband's brie, which they'll be very cross that I've removed from the fridge and had out of the fridge for too long, although that probably makes it much better to eat. So I tried to group these three. So three different types of 
talking about happiness. Du pain, du vin, du boursin. Du pain is the idea, and this is a kind of like basic, your bread and butter idea, right? That's why it's represented by du pain. Uh, it's the idea that happiness is only attainable when you're young. Happiness is, is for the young uh, and it's for the naive. And this idea, I'll explain this more in a moment, this idea is really exemplified by Françoise Sagan, Bonjour Tristesse, and Marguerite Duras, L'Amant. So those are two autobiographical novels written by women about, well, we have to assume they're semi-autobiographical, certainly in the case of uh, Marguerite Duras, definitely, Françoise Sagan, possibly slightly less. But they are teenage girls, uh, one age 15, one age 17, who are describing the fragility of happiness during that time and the purity of happiness when you experience it when you're an, an adolescent. So this idea of like bread and butter happiness is youth and something very beautiful about that idea but also very sad because obviously we cannot cling on to, to youth. So that's the first idea, happiness as youth. Le pain. Le vin, and this is all slightly mixed up because really, if you're talking about le vin, you have to talk about Marguerite Duras because she loved wine. Um, François Sagan was more about whiskey. But le vin, so this is like a more wine, adult idea of happiness uh, and slightly more, if you like, uh, mature, depressing idea of happiness. This is where we come to Proust and the idea of involuntary memory. So as an, as an adult, you experience these moments that are involuntary. So you don't get to control them. You don't get to decide when you're having an involuntary memory. That's why it's involuntary. It just comes upon you. Um, that is a moment that you can only really experience as adult happiness. And also the idea in uh, Cyrano de Bergerac by uh, Rostan, Edmond Rostan, that you do not get to control your own happiness, others have control over it. So this second idea is very much the idea of happiness coming from outside. The first idea is this idea of youthful happiness, something that you generate the way that you experience the world. The second idea is more to do with an adult realization that you can't be happy unless other people do things that are going to make you happy. In the case of Proust, it's him experiencing this involuntary memory that he can only access by accident. Uh, you can't will that upon yourself. And in the case of Cyrano de Bergerac, it's Cyrano realizing that the object of his affections is always going to be outside of his control, that he can't make somebody fall in love with him. I'll explain all this a bit more in the mo at the moment. If you're thinking, I haven't read any of these bits, I don't know what you're talking about, I'm going to explain um, without giving too many spoilers, hopefully. And then we come to Le Boursin, which is, uh, you know, the most mature, probably slightly stinky, I think, idea of a very depressing, uh, mature kind of happiness. Uh, and that is when your happiness is exclusively dependent on the well-being of others. So it's not something beautiful and fresh that you experience in adolescence. It's not this idea of realizing that happiness is something that happens externally to you, um, as exemplified by Proust and Cyrano, but it's this idea that you cannot be happy while others are unhappy. And the two authors I want to talk about in relation to that are Flaubert for Madame Bovary and Chaudelot de la Clos for Liaison Dangereuse, because those are two very, very ironic, difficult, jaded um, portrayals of humanity, which are almost um, really against any idea of happiness. Some of the most beautiful characters in those works are utterly miserable, horrible people, but we kind of fall in love with them anyway. And those two works really introduce this idea of this French happiness being very, very confusing and very self-contradicting because I always thought that the character, for example, of Madame Bovary, she's depicted um, as being this sort of horrible, uh, character who's completely obsessed with retail therapy, who's always cheating on her husband. And yet, uh, Flaubert himself said, Madame Bovary, c'est moi, 
he recognized that character in himself and he recognized how much we all love somebody who's actually a bit venal uh, just like the characters in dangerous liaisons who we kind of love to hate so this idea of happiness these three different kinds of happiness the youthful happiness the happiness that comes from recognizing that there's an external quality to it which can be good or can be bad and then this final idea which i think ultimately it's redemptive the idea that you can only be happy as long as other people are happy which plays out very badly um, in flubber and Chaudelo. the place where it plays out really well uh, and is the whole uh, raison d'etre if you like of the novel is in les miserables by Hugo. So in Les Miserables, the whole point of the novel is that there is no happiness in life whilst there is anyone on earth who is miserable. Um, it's, it's a novel about social justice. And so that idea of happiness is not necessarily something that's subjective, but it's also something that is uh, to do with, with social conscience and recognizing that as long as anybody in society is unhappy, there's no such thing as true happiness. So let me return to uh, flesh some of these ideas out a little bit more. And let's start with Bonjour Tristesse. Now, when I show you these uh, copies, they're just my copies that I love. And I'm not making any particular recommendation of any translation or anything like that. Um, I just happen to have these. I am one of the world's least snobby people about literature and translation. I don't believe in saying this translation is better than that one. If, if a translation has made it into print with a major publisher, it's been translated by someone who's devoted their life to translation. Um, and I know there are people who love to pick holes in people's translations, but I am not one of them. So this um, edition is excellent. And if you haven't read uh, Bonjour Tristesse, I would really recommend it for this uh, year as a summer read. This edition actually has two uh, novels in it, two novellas, and this is just, this part is Bonjour Tristesse. So this is only how long it is, it's only 100 pages. Uh, written in 1954 when Francois Sagan was 17 and became an absolutely huge hit um, over the next two years. And really interestingly when I was researching this I was thinking how can it be that we only really know this book in relation to Françoise Sagan what, what else did she write she wrote at least 50 more works but it never got to the point where any of them um, attained the success on the level of Bonjour Tristesse and this novel you know, written when she was 17 followed her throughout her whole life and she never really was quite able to escape it and if you go back and look at a lot of the coverage from when the novel came out. A lot of it was pretty brutal um, and quite rude about it. Uh, the Spectator um, called, in 1955 called it a sad little novel um, and it didn't really um, achieve the critical acclaim that you would have thought that something uh, that sold on this level w would have achieved. And now still, um, if you read around it um, and you read reviews by contemporary readers, people can often be quite disparaging of this novel and say, I don't really get it. It's nothing special. Nothing really happens. Well, it's not true that nothing really happens, but it just doesn't seem to have this profundity that the novel's reputation suggests. I don't agree with this at all. I think this novel is an extraordinary encapsulation of the, this idea I was talking about of adolescent happiness. She uh, describes this character of Cécile who goes to the south of France with her father and her father has these kind of two girlfriends who are being played off against each other and Cécile is watching all of this and trying to work out what's going on, trying to process her relationship with her father and trying to work out who she is as an adult. And for me, the evocation of happiness is really in the writing. The way she describes taking a sip of wine, drinking whiskey with her father, the feel of dappled sunlight on her skin, the smell of the sand, the salt of the sea, uh, the real visceral use of language in this novel is incredible. And you feel as if you're on holiday by the beach in the south of France reading it. And although it is in essence because of the plot, and I won't bring in the major plot spoiler, but which happens very suddenly right at the end, um, the essence of it doesn't seem to be particularly happy making. Um, it's quite an unhappy, moody 
difficult teenager who is watching a lot of adults arguing in front of her, building up to a tragic moment. It seems as if um, it's not an evocation of happiness, but in the writing and in her descriptions, and I love um, the way that she describes middle-aged people and how they react, um, interact with each other as well. The way that the um, the father's lover, the one who wins out in the end that he um, he proposes to, she always dresses beautifully, but there's something about her that isn't quite like a younger woman. All of those details, kind of a bit nasty, but just so beautifully done. And there's just something so joyous um, about this novel, which is, it's an extraordinary achievement for somebody writing when they were 17. The other brilliant evocation of this adolescent happiness, and I really think that reading either of these two books, it takes you back to your own teenage years. It doesn't matter what age you read them, but you feel you're inside the life um, of, of the teenage protagonist in both cases. So The Lover by Marguerite Duras, uh, written in 18, uh, sorry, 1984, or published in 1984, it describes events of the 1930s when Duras herself um, would have been a teenager, and it's set in Saigon. Um, one of the very few really well-known classics alongside uh, Camus that deals with any kind of French colonialism as well, it makes it really interesting. This depicts the true story of um, Marguerite Duras' uh, love affair with an older man when she was 15, and her mother's disapproval and you know, very similar tone to Bonjour Tristesse, where the teenage protagonist is trying to work out where do I feel my ha the most happy? What does it mean to be an adult? What is adult happiness? How can I find myself? Why do I feel so alive when I'm in love with this man and yet I'm being told that it's wrong because her lover is older than her? And this was a very difficult novel for Duras to write. She spent her whole life building up to writing it um, and didn't write it, I think, until she was in her um, 60s or 70s. And it's a very, again, bittersweet, beautiful evocation of that adolescent quality of happiness where everything seems so perfect in the moment and you don't have to think about what's going to happen next. And the way that Duras looks at it without over... Uh, without over-egging the sentimentality of that time um, is very beautifully done. And the way that she looks back on herself with this innocent wistfulness that feels as if it's happening right now uh, is just so excellent. So two books that really encapsulate for me this first idea, like this bread and butter idea of to be young is to be happy, which Maybe it's a depressing idea if you don't feel very young, but for me, that is the beauty of literature, is that you can read a book and feel young again. Maybe that's incredibly depressing. But so yeah, this is the idea, bread and butter, Lupin, adolescence as happiness. Now, this second idea, happiness is something that happens to us, not something that we choose. And Proust is obviously the biggest example of this. So I, I couldn't find my copies of Proust, which is really annoying. So I bought these to represent him instead. Um, for those of you who don't recognize this, this is Madeleine. So you've got the Madeleine. And if people, my American publishers told me that lots of people in the US don't know what a Madeleine is. I can't believe that, but um, this is what a Madeleine looks like. So it's one of these beautiful little, little cakes. And they look Proust's favorite. Proust is a really difficult author to talk about, generally speaking, and a difficult author to talk about in relation to happiness. But for me, this Madeleine idea, I'll explain more about that in a moment, really encapsulates why he is so important in this idea of French writers discovering happiness. Why is Proust difficult to talk about? Because the scope of his work is so massive. Um, à la recherche du temps perdu, known as a novel, is actually seven novels. It's over a million words. If you compare his output to the entirety of Shakespeare, the entirety of Shakespeare is 800,000 words, if you read everything that Shakespeare ever wrote. So just à la recherche du temps perdu is more than the output of Shakespeare. 
uh, highly, highly subjective, uh, author-focused, introspective novel, but also featuring a cast of 2,500 walk-on characters. So Proust is someone really, really difficult uh, to talk about. I, I think not least of all because most people haven't read all of the seven novels. Um, and when I studied French at university, when Proust came up, we were told um, you'll only be expected to read the first and the seventh of, of the seven parts of A la recherche du temps perdu, and that's on a French degree. So I feel as if uh, it's great with Proust to hone in on this one idea and it's the Madeleine idea which is of course the most famous for people who don't know about it it's this idea that when he ate or bit into a Madeleine soaked in tea one of these little cakes he would experience what has become known as involuntary memory for me it sounds pretty much like deja vu um, but I'm sure that it's much more exciting and literary um, and intellectual than that. It's the idea that when you experience something, whether it's a taste, a sight, a sound, some, uh, uh, anything that experiences, uh, causes an experience in your senses, that you are transported to a moment in your past where you had that experience before. So it's not just, you know, you eat the Madeleine and then you're reminded of another time when you eat a Madeleine because you could sort of make yourself remember that. It's involuntary. It's this transportation. And this is an idea that, you know, Proust came up with in the 1910s and has had a huge impact on literature and psychoanalysis ever since. The idea that we're not entirely in control of our memories, we're not entirely in control of our feelings, that we can be transported by these external events. And it really is a moment of true happiness and true, uh, if you like, kind of transcendental moment where you don't exist in time. You know, this is where the whole title of A la recherche du temps perdu comes, is in search of lost time. You're transported almost like in a kind of Doctor Who way back to that moment as if you are in it. So you experience that eating as if you experienced it for the first time. And for me, that's an incredibly useful and beautiful way to think about happiness, that you can't always be in control of it. You sometimes have to wait for it to just grab you and transport you somewhere. Um, and that's the idea behind involuntary memory. The Sister idea to this um, is Cyrano de Bergerac, um, and I wanted to include him alongside Proust in this idea of happiness being something outside of us that we can't really control, because it's just so joyous. And you know, if you haven't read um, the, this is the the play, and uh, you haven't got time to read a play or you don't want to, I would really, really recommend just watching Roxanne with Steve Martin. I mean, it's a completely different story, but they've taken the most important elements of it. They've taken some of the most beautiful quotes uh, in the original and, and, and put it in this very kind of 1980s slapstick movie. But the basic idea I, I want to highlight here is Serrano's great sadness in recognizing that the one happiness he wants can only be bestowed by the person who doesn't want him and there's something very beautiful and bittersweet about this in the same way that Proust can't will these memories upon himself he can't just time travel when he wants to and when he intends to eat a madeleine and have the memory it doesn't always happen uh, in the same way with, with Serrano it doesn't matter what he does, it, it doesn't matter uh, how he phrases it, how he goes about things, he, he can't get the woman that he loves. And he's doomed to, to live in this state of unhappiness because he can't experience that. And I love the way that, oh, I'm not gonna spoiler alert this either, but it does kind of all come good in the end, but in a terribly um, tragic way. But this for me is this um, kind of wine matured version of happiness where it's external to you you can't influence it when it does come be grateful breathe it in love it um, but just know that there's nothing that you can do to make it happen so then we come to this third idea which is exemplified by Flaubert uh, and Chaudelot de la Clos for Dangerous Liaisons so Flaubert for Madame Bovary this is the idea that 
happiness cannot exist whilst others are unhappy and this is just so brilliantly exemplified in this book because we have this character of Madame Bovary who's constantly seeking happiness outside of herself through her lovers through her shopping to some extent through her child although she only really wants the child to be something pretty and a plaything. She doesn't actually really want to engage emotionally with the child. Um, she, she's always seeking something outside of herself. And sometimes she achieves it. She's very happy um, at times in both of her um, relationships with her lovers, Leon and Rodolphe. She's very happy with her purchases on occasion when she buys her new dresses with three flounces on and she buys a new carpet and new curtains. And these things make her happy temporarily. But the great unhappiness at the heart of this novel um, is that her husband is so desperately unhappy and everything that she does makes him more unhappy. So this novel is really designed to show that we all want to be happy and we have a selfish regard for that. You know, we, we desperately want to be happy for ourselves and we do things um, that in attempts to become happy and sometimes they work, but they are flawed, they are poisoned, um, not to put too much of a spoiler on it, but in the end she poisons herself, okay, I've spoiled it, um, but they're literally poisoned because you are making other people unhappy. So uh, it, this is a very beautiful, funny, clever, romantic novel, but at its heart, it's, it's very dark and it's very didactic. It's basically saying that no one's happiness is worth the misery of another person. But at the same time, Flaubert is constantly playing with this and ironizing it because he recognizes that he's just as selfish as Madame Bovary. We're all just as selfish as she is. We all do things um, for our selfish happiness that make thing, uh, other people unhappy. Um, and in the end, um, everybody, everybody loses out and it all goes very badly. Uh, the other work where this plays out brilliantly is of course, Dangerous Liaisons, Chaux de l'eau de la Clos. Um, this is such a wonderful read. Uh, it's a great one as well if your French is a bit rusty and you want to test it out. It's written in letter form, so you're just reading letters. It makes it pretty easy to read, uh, even in French. Uh, and this, of course, people who have seen the, the film with Glenn Close and, uh, Glenn Close and John Malkovich will realise it's about these two very evil characters who gain their happiness by making others miserable. And they're not really interested in the um, actual feeling of happiness in themselves, it's more important to them that others are put down and made miserable by their actions. And ultimately, this destroys both of them because they want to pretend that they don't have any feelings. The whole novel is really about not having feelings um, and it's about that sector of society um, who want to treat everything as if it's beneath them. Um, people, feelings, each other. And in the end, they are the losers because they do make other people extremely miserable and they destroy their lives. But ultimately, the pleasure that they had hoped they would get from this is completely illusory because they did have feelings and passion for each other and they were hiding it. So three very different ways of looking at happiness that travel through these three stages of life. And this is what I love about French literature as well, is that I think you can access any of these books at any time in your life, you know, much as you can with you know, many examples of uh, English literature and Russian literature as well. But with these classics, uh, which I think are, this is why it's so useful for the present moment, this idea of comfort reading. Classics are classics because you can use them to measure your own life. So you could read this, any of these books now and have a response to it and think, oh yeah, that reminds me of my adolescence and what does that tell me about how I saw myself as a teenager? You could then return to it in 10 years time and know how you've changed as a person. The, the book changes according to who you are as a person. And for me, this is what the real measure of a classic and a lasting classic is. Uh, and you know why these books have stood the test of time is because they tell us something about how we relate to ourselves, how we relate to the idea of what does it mean to be an adult? How do we relate to the idea of what do you have to do with your life to be happy? 
and the judgment that you have of these different characters of, you know, I can't believe she behaved like that in order to be happy changes throughout your life because you become more or less judgmental. Sometimes it can be uh, to do with maturity. Other times it can just be to do with what state of mind you're in at the time. But these novels are all a, uh, and plays are a great measure of where you are at in your own mind and with your own happiness. So I want to throw this open to questions if Dana is there and comments. I have got a few more things I want to say, but I'd love to know what responses people are having to this and what questions I can answer. Um, thank you, Viv. Uh, there's been quite a few questions and responses. Uh, Good. I just want to preface, I don't speak French, so excuse any mispronunciation. Oh, that's even better, Dana. We shall teach you. Um, Do this. I'll start sort of with an, the anonymous attendee um, who has more of a comment. It says, mm -hmm. I totally agree with you, Re Bonjour Tristesse. When I first read it around 16 years old, I thought it the most perfect description of the teenage romantic experience. I told anybody that would listen it was the best book I'd ever read and it awakened something in me. I reread oh, it in 40. So I reread oh. it aged 40 and thought it how ridiculous I seemed. Testament to the development of wisdom or sadly, cynicism perhaps. <laughs> Yeah, that's really interesting. I do think that that book, I don't think it's a book that you read when you're young and then you read it when you're older and think, oh, what a load of nonsense. But I do think that it reflects the cynicism in your mind. So I think that you could come back to it another time and be more light of spirit and more forgiving of yourself and, and be more carried away with it. Um, but yeah, thank you. That's a lovely comment. Um, from Celia, a question. What are your thoughts on Le Rouge et Le Noir and the idea oh. of happiness and materialism? Okay, well, I have it right here. Le Rouge et Le Noir. Uh, this is, I would say, I'd be interested to know what people think. I think this is probably for um, English speaking readers, a lesser known novel, um, but it is in the same kind of ballpark as as Flaubert's Madame Bovary and if you love Madame Bovary you'll love this book. So this book is very interesting because it really is about the idea of well you mentioned she wants it particularly about materialism yeah so this idea of materialism we've already seen in Madame Bovary like can you achieve happiness by acquiring things and it's this middle a sort of middle class 19th century fairly new idea of you know the aristocracy is losing power the bourgeoisie is gaining power and you can attain social status happiness the respect of others by having beautiful things around you um, and le rouge et le noir is really about a character who wants to become happy and become respected and and feel like a, a feel like a man <laughs> by attaining a lot of the it's not only material it's also like superficial aspects of the class above him and again without bringing in too many spoilers obviously it all goes very badly wrong but he's a similar character to Madame Bovary in that he um, he's called Julien Sorel uh, and he wants to increase his power in society and and marry up you know uh, Madame Bovary tries to marry up it doesn't really work um, Julien Sorel also tries to uh, marry up he has uh, affairs with the with uh, married women who are in very well-to-do families to try and get closer to that way of life uh, he he's a brilliant Latin scholar and he believes that by speak uh, teaching Latin and speaking Latin he oh who does that remind you of uh, he can impress other people uh, with his brilliance but there's something very fake at the heart of it all and ultimately it's about ego you know he has so much ego that's tied up in all of this and it very quickly becomes undone because this materialism and this superficial way that he wants to uh, travel through life um it's obviously you know it has no integrity so it all falls apart but yeah a great great novel and a great companion um for madame bovary a disclaimer for le rouge et le noir red and the black is it's quite religious that's the whole point of the red 
and the black the black is the cloth the red is the army or there's lots of uh, theories about what, what what represents what um but it is quite a lot of it is about the failing power of the church and the failing power of spirituality um but i um, that's made it sound really serious it is quite a serious novel but i still would recommend it um david has a bit of a follow-up question to this mm -hmm. um in that do you think happiness is related to nostalgia the attempt to recapture a moment or period of happiness in the past um thinking of proust and particularly Alain Fournier's Les Grandes Moulinis. Oh, I'm loving your French, Dana. Excellent <laughs> French. Um, yes, the idea of nostalgia, I mean, I feel as if I've touched upon it in almost every single work that has been mentioned. And I do think that the idea of nostalgia is something that is particularly prevalent in French literature. You don't see it so much in Russian literature, you don't see it so much in American or English literature, but the idea of memory, even before Proust encapsulated it and became the person who is most known um, for, the, for memory as a theme, even before then, the idea of um, memory, history, harking back to times when things were better is a huge uh, theme in French literature. I'm trying to think um, where else. Oh yeah, so I also had wanted to mention um, Balzac and memory is something that Balzac approaches in a very um, well contradictory way I would say in that his uh, his novels are more Dickensian so they're des they're describing worlds, communities, um, all kinds of intricate family relationships um, in La Comédie Humaine and, and this La Cousine Bette, which I feature in Au Tristesse, which is all about somebody who doesn't have anything to be nostalgic about. It's a lot of his characters are people in search of something that they want to be remembered for or in search of nostalgia, something that they can call their own. And a lot of his um, really difficult characters, like La Cousin Bette is a really sort of difficult, brilliant, evil character. They have like a fake nostalgia for their childhood or the life that they could have led. And they're constantly trying to do things to recapture that, that are basically doomed. So yeah, I completely agree. The theme of nostalgia is, is huge and I think it yeah it figures more highly in French literature than in literature of any other language. That was a very sweeping statement of mine but I stand by it. <laughs> um, thanks Viv. Uh, from John, do you consider Andre Makin Brief Lives That Live Forever as a modern classic? I love this, like people are going to talk about every single French novel that's ever been written in the history of the world. Um, I have read André Makin. Um, I don't know if I've read that one. The question is, do I think he's a modernist or a modernist classic? Um, would you consider, I guess, the book or him as a, as a modern classic? Um, which kind of yeah, actually... I'm a bit purist about my interpretation of classic. I really think that we don't know that something is a classic until about a hundred years later although that's like i mean i suppose we are like 70 years since bonjour tristesse but um i think it takes a good generation for a work to show its worth beyond the time that it was published so i would suggest that andre makin is a little bit too recent but um, is he a great writer, hugely recommended? Yes, of course. Um, and I'm also very, um, I'm quite purist as well about how uh, accessible things are and how many people know about things. You know, that's a fairly superficial measure of a classic. But I think uh, a classic is really like, how many people have heard of this book? How many people are likely to have read it? F even people who don't know what this book is, could they vaguely tell you what it's about? Um, which I think, you know, in Proust, people have like some idea of like, oh, he just stayed in bed all the time and he was in love with his mother and then he ate some Madeleine. You know, people even who know nothing about French literature can tell you that. So I tend to go for very basic <laughs> descriptions of, of what a classic is. And I've thought about this a lot because my last book, about literature, the Anna Karenina fix, Life Lessons from Russian Literature, was also looking at the idea of what is a classic, you know, 
can we still say that Tolstoy and Dostoevsky are classics, even if lots of people don't read them now, which I think actually lots of people are rediscovering them now. But I really, uh, and there's also, there's a lot of um, division about this idea as well. And I, I tackle this um, in the book that if you look at anything that we call a classic in any form of literature, the author is very likely to be what people would now call pale, male and stale. Um, they're very likely to be white, uh, most of them are men, um, and that's because that is the nature of 18th, 19th century, early 20th century writing. Uh, and is that fair? Should those be the only classics? Um, but then you get to the point that you, you can't suddenly ex excavate, um, you know, the female Dickens, um, this person doesn't exist, or, um, or, you know, in the Russian context, it's really difficult to find um, classic female writers. Um, French, you get them in the 20th century, but not really in the 19th century. So yeah, I say yes, please read Andre Makin, um, but classic for me is a much more pure definition and not necessarily a definition that we might feel entirely comfortable with with a modern sensibility. Um, this next question you touched on just briefly in a previous answer, but an anonymous attendee would like to know, um, do you find that there are certain distinguishing features between French and English literature? Yeah, great question. I always think I'm not, um, my field of knowledge is Russian and French literature, and I always think I know nothing about English literature. I studied um, French, German, Spanish, Russian at, at school and at university, and the thing that went by the wayside with that was uh, English literature. And I was reading literature and translation when other people were reading Jane Eyre. So I had a really, really late awakening to American and English literature, and I actually took an English literature A-level when I was 37, um, because I felt so bad about this, <laughs> um, that my knowledge of English literature was so bad. But on a very, in a superficial way, uh, yes, I, I do think they're different, and just as Russian literature is different and American literature is different, but you have many uh, writers who are parallel. So, for example, you know, you can compare Virginia Woolf and Chekhov, you can compare Dickens and Balzac. Uh, there's usually a version of, of any literature's uh, writing in another language. Um, in terms of the tone of things, I do think that, yeah, superficially, superficially as a generalization, there are certain qualities of our idea of what a nationality means or what a language means or what a language allows that are reflected um, in, in the language and literature of that country. Um, does it matter? That's what I think is quite interesting. You know, does it matter? And does talking about it just reinforce stereotypes and superficial divisions? Because we could say, oh, French literature is really romantic and English literature is obsessed with class. Um, I suppose we could say something like that. But is that helpful? I mean, you can find plenty of English literature that is romantic. You can find plenty of French literature that is obsessed with class. So I think that the um, differences are stronger than the similarities. Um, thank you, Viv. Uh, David, asks, do you believe that studying philosophy in secondary level schools or high schools in the US, like the French, would help us in Anglophone countries? Yeah, what a great question, David. Um, at the moment, speaking from London, I feel like it would be helpful if anybody could go to school at all. I currently have three children who are home from school. Um, yeah, the question of philosophy is really interesting and philosophy is still taught, I think to age 16 at least, possibly. I don't think it's taught to age 18 in France, but I'm happy to be corrected, but it's taught as a curriculum subject, um, which is obviously not in the, in the UK or uh, I guess in the US. I do think that 
philosophy and I haven't I haven't studied philosophy I've only studied philosophy like alongside um, reading French writers and reading around um, the passions of the various writers that I love and I feel as if that's missing um, from my understanding I think that philosophy is a bit like the classical languages Latin and Greek that it gives you a grounding in a way of thinking in theory in in the practice of theory um, in the practice of arguing and debating um, that is incredibly useful and for me I personally would have loved it if I could have had more study of philosophy and of psychology um, when I was much younger certainly before the age of 18 how you introduce that in the modern world where I think those uh, kind of subjects like philosophy Latin Greek are seen as being old-fashioned and unimportant by a majority of people um, who would probably rather that people are taught business studies or practical skills, which also are useful. Um, I think that's difficult. I, I don't think it would necessarily be a popular choice if people brought that in, but I think it would be useful. And yeah, if I was in charge, then everyone would have to study Latin and everyone would have to study philosophy. Vote for me. <laughs> Luckily, I'm not standing for public office. Um, Emma asks, uh, what book would you recommend to someone who's just coming to French literature to read first? Just coming to French literature to read first, I would recommend, well, I, I would easily say Bonjour Tristesse um, because it's so quick and easy to read. Um, I feel as if I've given lots of recommendations of this already. So to give something different, I would suggest um, novels that I read uh, when I was um, around 16 and really trying to speak French really well and prepare for my university. And that is Marcel Pagnol. So that's um, Jean de Florette and Manon des Sources. And you can easily watch the films first. The films are wonderful and then read the books. Um, they'll be available in translation. If you're learning French, they're a good kind of solid A-level text standard for like age 16 to 18. Uh, if you've got a few years of French under your belt, you should be able to manage those. And they're cracking read, like balance between commercial and literary. And they give you this wonderful flavor of the South of France, the environment that Marcel Pagnol grew up in, they're based on a true story that his grandmother told him when he was a child and they're steeped in yeah the romanticism of that area and nature and the elements um yeah so Jean de Florette uh, and Manon de Source I would really really recommend uh, if you love crime then obvious place to go is Georges Simenon a Belgian French writer one of the most prolific crime writers of all time um Sometimes the French like to claim him, but he is Belgian French. He's kind of Belgium's answer to Agatha Christie. Um, hugely prolific, um, the Inspector Maigret stories. Really great translations. Also not that difficult to read in French. Um, yeah, so Simonon, if you love crime. And it isn't grisly crime. Um, quite, I don't want to say it's cosy because he's quite clever. Um, but yeah, really quality. Uh, again, balance between commercial and literary. Um, thanks, Viv, for all those recommendations. Uh, we've been getting many comments um, about you taking people back to their university years and um, younger times when they've read many of these. Um, Wilson asks, after all these readings, do you believe happiness is attainable at all? Why or why not? Uh, what a great question. Um, I really believe and it, this is sort of twin answer in a way. I believe that happiness is that to do with that second quality that I mentioned of like it's externally imposed. So you can't really conjure it up for yourself. You have to wait for it to land upon you. But the more you realize that, the more you can appreciate the moments when it does land upon you and think, oh, yeah, this is making me happy. And then, of course, as soon as you, you've realized that, it, it's gone again. Um, that idea of that, you know, the Paul Eloi quote that I said at the beginning, you know, you only recognize happiness as it's leaving you. Uh, and I really believe that. There's a, there's a saying in Russian as well. Um, happiness is there where we are not. 
it's always this feeling uh, of the grass is greener. But the flip side of that, the, the um, perhaps more positive idea that we can be in control of and sort of twin to that answer is that I, I believe happiness is in reading. You know, I mean, don't tell my husband, obviously, I'm very happy when I'm with my husband and my children too. But I, I really believe there's a great happiness and joy and contentment and comfort and reassurance is to be found in reading. And that's because when you read something, you have this extraordinary connection with the person who wrote it. They transport you to another world. They transport you to another story. You're, it's, a, it's a, such a fascinating relationship that we don't talk about very much, the relationship that you have with the storyteller you're reading. And to me, it's extraordinary that you could read something that has been written um, in 1854 and that person's long dead. Uh, everything that gave them the idea for the book is long dead, but you're with them. You're having a conversation with them. They're, they're talking and you're listening. Um, that to me is an extraordinary, joyful moment of humanity. And I really believe that that's the great attraction and the plus of reading classics is that they're a reminder of how lasting human connection is and that you know even when people die years later you can read their work and absolutely feel it be touched by it i find that extraordinary and that idea it makes me very happy thank you viv um there's quite a few people asking about how many languages you speak fluently and how one can master a language Oh, okay. What a great question. Well, um, one thing I meant to mention in the beginning, actually, was the importance of this conversation. Um, I can only speak from the UK experience, but I was looking at the statistics, thinking about, you know, why is this important? Why does it matter? You know, why should we talk about all these dead French authors, you know, most of whom um, were not very nice people and, and were drunks and had syphilis? You know, why should we care about them? And I realised that the level at which French is taught and the level that we're allowed to access languages is it's just being destroyed. Um, and this isn't a recent thing just because of Brexit, but over the last 20 years in the UK, the decline in French taught to GCSE le level, which is age 16, is 60 percent. And that that's huge. You know, when I was a child, it was not everybody was taught French. It was it doesn't you know not everybody could speak French, but everybody had a smattering of French and they had, you know, some access to some teaching and, and a little bit of confidence about being able to go into a shop and ask for what they want. You know, my, my sister's a French teacher and this just isn't the case anymore. You know, people don't expect to be their children to be taught languages. And in many cases, it's just been forgotten. So language teaching is, I think, so important. If you can understand even a very small amount of another language, you have access to understanding other people's cultures, other people's ideas. It's so completely fascinating and life affirming to be able to do that. And it broadens your mind. And when we're all trapped in our own little language silos, I really believe that our thinking is na narrowed. Uh, by that. So um, I speak uh, French, German, Spanish to A-level. Uh, so, well, I did those for A-level and I did Latin A-level. Then I did Russian from scratch at university. So the languages I speak fluently are French and Russian. And then my German and Spanish are not great, but I could probably have a conversation with somebody at a dinner party. Um, yeah, I do think, I don't, I don't have any snobbery about that at all. And I don't um, believe it makes you a better person exactly. Uh, if you can speak a language and the thing is some people are good at picking up languages some people aren't but the more you can master at least a little bit of a language I do think it increases your self-belief it empowers you and it broadens your mind so it's incredibly important um, thank you Viv so much um, it looks like we're actually out of time I know okay. there are so many other questions and comments that we didn't get to, um, but thank you all for submitting those. Um, thank Can you. Can I finish Viv. on a quote, Dana? Of course. Yeah, I'd like to uh, finish on another really beautiful quote um, that I found so people can practice their, practice their French as I say this. This is from André Gide. 
his meditation on happiness. He's a contemporary of Proust and Camus. So Gide says, Si nous ne reconnaissons pas plus souvent le bonheur, if we don't recognize happiness very often, si nous ne reconnaissons pas plus souvent le bonheur, c'est qu'il vient à nous avec un visage autre que celui que nous attendions. It is because it comes to us with a face other than the one we were expecting. So if we don't recognize happiness, it's because we weren't expecting it to look like that. So may we know happiness when we see it. Thank you, Viv. That's beautiful. Um, thank you everyone at home for joining us. Um, just a few reminders that the replay will be available within three days. So all of Viv's great recommendations for reading and what she's reading, um, you'll be able to go through the replay um, to note all of those down. Um, and then we will also be sending out the link to buy Viv's new book, which is out this week in the US and next week in the UK. Um, and thank you all again for joining us and thank you so much Viv.